The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! <laughs> you think he's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? <laughs> well, I must have not been paying attention. When you were just talking to me Do you think that you could repeat the question? I swear to God, Facebook changed the format again They must do it on Every Wednesday yeah. They must do it on Wednesday Because they know I do my show on yeah. Thursdays <laughs> Unbelievable Like, let's just mess with them My coffee went cold. I still got my cookies. Joyce left the cookies for us. Uh-huh. It was awfully nice of her. I love Joyce Campagnon. She's good people. She's just such a nice person. Just a little distraught. Everybody do the Baba Paz. <clears throat> I didn't hear Rich on that one. Fired. Fired. <laughs> Fired. Sorry, we got to let you go, Rich. Yep. You can't bop, bop, The Baba Paz are manda- You're not part of the mandatory team. Valley Peaches. Yeah. Oh, boy. Fine, we'll give him another chance. All right, let's, hey, let's start this abortion of a show, All shall right. we? All right. Hi, how you guys doing? My name's Tom Duggan here with the Paying Attention Podcast. Hi, atop two guys smoke shop at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. We were supposed to have Caroline Pino in here today. She is from STEM in Haverhill. It's a pot shop in Haverhill because a lot of controversy surrounding that. But mm-hmm. she had an emergency last minute. She couldn't make it. So in, in the span of, what, 10 minutes... Um, yeah. I, I had to I had to figure out what we're going to do for a show, right? So sometimes these are our best shows, but I have no idea what we're going to do. Yeah. Right. And then we go out, we go live, and I just do shit off the top of my head. Yeah. Next one, I'm like, all right, you got to wrap this up. Right, we need to right, go now. Right. And then <laughs> afterwards, I look back and I go, wow, that was actually better than a planned Great. show. Sometimes. Yeah. A few things that I do want to touch on today, none of which was we were planning on talking about. Uh, I want to talk a lot about Lawrence today, and I will touch on Methuen uh, a little bit. Um, Yesterday, was it yesterday, Rich, that there was a big fight? It was like the second or third big fight at Lawrence High School. Um, I I want you guys to look at this as like a social studies lesson. You know, one of the things that I try to do in my job is to look at what's going on in any particular issue, any particular thing that's going on in the community, and look at it from a 30,000-foot view. Like, what does this represent? Mm -hmm. And what can we learn from this? And one of the things that I think we learned is something that I've talked, that hopefully you guys learned, that I've been talking about for a long time. So there's been a spate of violence at Lawrence High School. Not really a surprise, right? Because there's no discipline at Lawrence High School. Nobody knows who's in charge. The teachers certainly aren't in charge. And by the way, nobody gets held accountable for the horrible job they do educating kids. Most of the kids, through no fault of their own, graduate Lawrence High School. They can't speak, read, and write the English language fluently enough to get a job or get into college. And why is that? It's not the kids' fault. Don't blame the kids. I don't even bl- Some people blame the parents. I'm not even blaming the parents. I blame the teachers and the administrators who have substandards for kids who are black and brown in Lawrence as opposed to the standards that are in Andover and North Andover. And as we've said on previous shows, Lawrence gets twice as much money as Andover and North Andover combined for their schools. So the substandard education that they're getting is not for lack of funding. And it's certainly not because black kids and brown kids and Latino kids are dumber than white kids, right? White kids aren't in Andover aren't any smarter than the kids in Lawrence are. It's because of the education that they're not getting. And they aren't getting an education. And because there is no discipline at Lawrence High School, kids can hit teachers and end up back in the classroom the next day. I get calls all the time from teachers and teacher aides in the schools. 
and the and every complaint is almost the same. There's a kid in my class. He, he he punched another kid, or he punched a teacher. The next day, he's back in the classroom. We're being told there's nothing we can do, and so the kids, being kids, are going to do what kids do. And whenever you whenever kids don't have controls. Whenever they don't have discipline, they're going to keep pushing the envelope and they're going to keep doing more and more things. So what has been the solution of Kendris Vasquez, the mayor of Lawrence, the school committee, and the people who run the, and run the school system? What was their solution? We're going to have a rally. We're going to hold signs and chant pithy slogans. No more violence. Yay. No more violence. Yay. How'd that work out? Because they had one of those stupid rallies that do absolutely nothing. These community, these community uh, uh, meetings where they all sit down and pretend that they care. And, of course, they all just grandstand to get their names in the paper. And they have meetings about meetings about meetings. And they sit there and they talk about violence. But then two days later, there's more violence. Yeah. So, so it, you know, the definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over, expecting the same result. I wouldn't say that they're crazy because they're not expecting a different result. They know, the politicians know, especially the politicians that run Lawrence, know full well that having a rally and having a meeting is not going to stop some violent kid at Lawrence High School from committing violence. There's never been a kid in the history of kids who was going to commit a violent act and went, oh, yeah, I really shouldn't do that, though, because they were chanting pithy slogans and they were rhyming last night. You know, they rhymed so good last night. Well, I'm not going to punch that guy in the face that I don't right. like, right? I'm not going to punch that teacher. I'm not going to sell drugs at school. I'm not going to do these things, right? Now, why is there more violence in Lawrence than there is in Andover and North Andover? It's not because, not because Latino kids are more violent than white people. I, mean, I know some people believe that. I don't, right? So why is there more violence? And I would say it's because it's tolerated in Lawrence. If you tried that in Andover, your ass would get thrown out of class, Right. right. You do that in North Andover, your ass would get thrown out of class. You do it in Lawrence, eh, well, he had a bad childhood. He comes from a violent neighborhood. He doesn't have both parents at home. We saw when we had, and I don't want to embarrass her, so I'm not going to say her name, but we had a candidate for Lawrence mayor on at one point who gave those excuses when I said, why do the white kids in Andover and North Andover get a better education than Lawrence? Well, the funding, and I said, wait a minute, they get more funding than Andover and North Andover. Well, they come from bad homes, there's violence in their neighborhoods, their parents can't speak English. Listen, all of those, with all due respect to all the people who hold that position, all of those positions are excuses. That's what they are. Because you take any child from any background, from any neighborhood, whether it's violent or not, whether they're black or white, whether they're Latino or they're not, no matter who they are, if you, if you tell kids, if you convey to kids that there are no rules, they're going to misbehave. That's the nature of kids. And again, I'm not blaming the kids, and I'm not blaming the parents either. I'm blaming the Lawrence school system. When Brian DePino was here, I asked him, don't, don't you hold accountable the teachers and the administrators for the fact that these kids are graduating and they don't have the skills to get a good job or get into a four-year college? Don't you hold them accountable? He said, absolutely, yes. Guess who doesn't hold them accountable? That would be the current mayor, Ken, Kennedy Vasquez. Kennedy Vasquez, uh, we talked about this on a previous show, and I'm going to highlight it again today a little bit because uh, the election is in 12 days in Lawrence, and you have, uh, um, if you haven't made up your mind yet, now is the, now is the time to do it. Kennedy Vasquez, back in May, was at a, um, a board of education meeting at the state, where one of the Board of Education members said, um, let's see, I'm going to pull it up. Uh, I had it here and now it's gone. So I'll paraphrase. So one of the school board uh, members said, why should we turn Lawrence schools back over to the Lawrence people? Because the state has taken over the school system. By the way, I know there's a lot of people who think that, you know, the state taking over the schools is a good thing. And in a way, it kind of was at the beginning. The idiots that are running the State Board of Education, and, I, and I'm excluding Jeff Riley for one second uh, on this, but the idiots who run the Board of Education, the, the teachers' unions, the administrators, and all the political hacks that, that, are, that are working in the Department of Education for the state, they're worse. They're worse. They want to teach critical race theory to your kids. And what is critical race theory? Critical race theory is this minority belief that white people are racist by virtue of being white. Now, I, I'm of the old school Martin Luther King school school where we don't judge people based on the color of their skin. We judge them based on the content of their character. 
And I think teaching children that white people are bad by virtue of being white is, I don't know what Martin Luther King would call that, maybe racism. And so this member of the Department of Education basically said, why should we give the schools back to Lawrence when you haven't proven that you, that you can run your schools? And Kendris Vasquez, instead of saying, you know what, he's right. We shouldn't get control of our schools back. Look what's going on in the schools. We need to, we need to put a plan together to make sure that these teachers and administrators in the schools, at the very least, are teaching kids the skills that they need to get a job or get into college when they graduate. Because most of them can't. Instead, Kendris Vasquez decided to play the race card and called that member of the Department of Education racist. He was a racist because he's saying that Latinos can't run a school system. That's not what he said. It's not even close to what he said. But instead of saying that, Kendrick Vasquez could have had a home run, couldn't he have? He could have come out and said, you know what, they're right. They're right. Let's put a plan together. Let's have a zero tolerance policy. For, yeah, they have zero tolerance policies for everything else. If a kid brings an aspirin to school and they catch the kid with an aspirin, he's automatically suspended. Because we have a zero tolerance policy for any kind of drugs, anything, even an aspirin. Right? But when it comes to violence, for some reason, we don't have a zero tolerance policy. It should be a zero tolerance policy. Any kid that commits any violence against a teacher, a student, a janitor, a librarian, um, a, a social worker, anybody who works in the schools, anybody on school property, if the kid commits violence, he should be tossed. And that's it, period. He gets tossed. And I don't want to hear, well, what about, the, what, about the poor child? what about that poor child, though? He's only striking out because of his childhood. Those are excuses. Because you could, I was abused as a child. I'm not out there beating people up. I never used it as an excuse for my failures, okay? My aunt and uncle raised me because, I was, uh, because my father's wife used to beat the crap out of me when I was a kid. And I ended up going to live with my aunt and uncle, and they, and they did a fantastic job raising me. But they got me at nine years old, okay? The abuse had already happened, and the effects on my personality already happened. But when you give kids of any stripe, of any background, no matter what, whether they've been abused or not as a kid, when you give them limits when you discipline them, when you show them where the line is and you have consequences for crossing that line, I don't care how bad the kid was beaten as a kid. I don't care how violent the neighborhood is that he comes from. I don't care if he's got mother, a mother and father at home or one parent at home or no parents at home and he's a foster kid. Those are not excuses for violence. The, 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 you want to talk about root causes, Democrats raise, we have to talk about root causes, which is really just an abstract way of saying we don't want to solve the problem. But if you want to talk about root causes, the only root cause to this, of what's going on in Lawrence, is that there are no standards. And whatever standards that they say they have on paper, in the, in the real world, it doesn't get followed. All right? There, there's no consequence of teaching. And by the way, if you have a school system that is teaching kids to hate the police, to hate Republicans and Donald Trump because they're evil Nazis, to hate the system, that, that America is a systemically racist place. You are teaching them to hate authority. And you are teaching them to hate the authority that is over them. And it's only going to be a matter of time before they go from hating the cops and hating America to hating the teachers and the administrators because they represent the system too. And they don't realize that, you know, all these, all these woke educators who want to turn our kids into little social activists but aren't teaching them how to add and subtract or science or actual history, what they have to understand is that every revolution turns on itself every single time. Look throughout history. Every revolution, they, they turn on themselves. Eventually, they run out of enemies and they turn on each other. And that's what's happening here in Lawrence. You're seeing the, 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 from the big picture, from the 30,000-foot view, we're looking at the Lawrence Public Schools, and I, again, do not blame the students or the parents, okay? It shouldn't matter, and it doesn't matter if you've got a parent at home who doesn't speak English. And it doesn't matter if you've got a parent at home that maybe is neglectful or abusive. What matters is when the kid walks in the door, are there rules and are there consequences for breaking those rules? Period. Period. Because the first time the kid breaks the rules that he has a serious consequence... And then the next time he breaks the rules, there's a, a, a progressive, more serious consequence. And, and, and then the third time, eventually, that kid's going to stop. Or he's going to get tossed out, and at least he's not interfering with the education other kids are trying to get in the classroom. We're not causing problems. And, and you know, whenever these issues come up 
Everybody runs to their partisan corners. Democrats want to talk about root causes and systemic racism, and Republicans want to talk about why there's no more, that we need more funding, it's got to be funding. None of those are the answer, none of them. The left and the right are full of shit on all of this. How about let's get back to basics? By the way, the other excuse they use, class size. There's just too many kids in the class for the teachers to, to handle. Well, yeah, if you're not going to discipline them. But let's go back to when my father, my father graduated, I think 19, I'm guessing now, right? I'm going to say my father graduated like 1959 or 1960, somewhere around there, right? Now, when my father graduated Lawrence High School, I remember him telling me that they had upwards of 60 kids in a classroom. They got a better education then than these kids are getting today with 20 kids in a classroom. So again, we look at history just a little bit. And we know that the excuses that we're being fed by our politicians are full of shit. I don't, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but what I am saying is that the people that are in charge are not giving us the right answers. And I know for sure, I know kids, I've raised kids, I've been a kid, we've all been kids. We know that if you have a, if you have a, a babysitter or a substitute teacher or an uncle that takes care of the kid for the weekend and they've got no rules and they let the kid run rampant, and then the kid goes home at the end of the week and it takes the parents like three days to deprogram the kid to get him to behave again, right? Now imagine they're going to school every day in that environment. Well, there are no rules. I mean, there are rules. They're on paper, but nobody's following them, right? But at the same time, all these kids are being taught about abortion and transgender bathrooms and gay marriage. They're being turned into little social justice warriors. Their emotions are being manipulated over racism and class warfare. But they don't know the first thing about the First Amendment and they don't know the first thing about cell structure in science class. They don't know how to add and subtract. I use, I use this ex example all the time. You pull up to, to Wendy's or Taco Bell in Lawrence, and your bill comes to 10.25, and you hand the little girl a 20, and then you find a quarter, and you hand her the quarter, but she's already re rung it in. You can see the corpuscles in her head start to explode. She has no idea what to do. She doesn't know to just give you back another 10. She can't do the math in her head. And again, it's not her fault. And it's not the parents' fault. The parents, the parents' job is to parent their kids, not educate them. It's the school's job to educate their kids. And they're not educating them. And we pump more money in, and they continue not to educate them. And the state comes in and takes over, and we're still not educating them. And there's violence and melees in the school and outside the school, and they're still not educating them. So how about the schools? Uh, if we get a new mayor... And Kendra's, and Kendra's Vasquez wins or Brian DePena wins. If, we, if the new mayor were to come in and say, zero tolerance policy, maybe the state's controlling the schools right now, but as mayor, I control the police department. So I'm going to give a directive to my officers. I want two officers in Lawrence High School every day on duty as part of their regular shift. And any kid that hits another kid, any kid that commits violence is immediately arrested. I don't care what the Department of Education says. I'm the mayor. I'm the mayor, I'm in charge of the police department, and I'm going to issue a directive that that kid goes into the system, he gets arrested, he gets a record, and if the schools aren't going to do something about the violence in the schools, I'm going to do something about it. That's leadership. That's what leaders do. They look at a problem, they see how it's not being solved, and then they find a way to solve it. They say, oh, these are the things that are outside of my control, so I'm going to look at the things that are within my control and try and use those things to solve the problem. Now, are you ever going to completely solve the problem? Of course not. There's always going to be kids in every school system that, that cause problems. However, the size and scope of those problems are going to be directly tied to how the administration handles it when it happens the first time. We, had, we did a story about a year and a half ago about two kids having sex in the hallways at Lawrence High School, and there were pictures and video Kids were standing there watching two kids having sex and took pictures and video and then posted them online, okay? Those kids were in class the next day. There was no consequence for either of those kids. So what do you think they're going to do tomorrow? They're going to be, in the, they're gonna be in, in, in the broom closet getting a Hummer again. They're going to be getting sex in the broom, broom closet. They're going to be down in the gym under the bleachers fooling around. Why wouldn't they? There was no consequence the first time. You've got an election coming up in Lawrence in 12 days. You've got a number of people running for office. I'm not telling you all of these people are perfect. I'm not telling you all of these people are going to completely solve the problem because I don't think any problem can be completely solved. But you can certainly mitigate the damage. 
I think if you elect Brian DePena, he at least will try to do something about it. The teachers union, by the way, who do absolutely nothing about the violence in the schools. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up for you. Uh, right before we went on the air, I pulled up the story in today's Eagle Tribune, which I try not to do. But I wanted to see if they, they had something that uh, wasn't in yesterday's press release. How about this? I want you guys to listen to this. I'm going to read it very slowly for you. Mayor Kendris Vasquez and members of the Lawrence Teachers Union said the fighting is linked to anxiety and tensions that students have experienced after returning to in-person classes following the remote teacher shutdown, uh, learning shutdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic. Are you fucking kidding me? Seriously? The people who are running your schools that are allowing this crap to happen every day have the nerve to say with a straight face in the Eagle Tribune, if they said it, it's the Tribune, so you're going to divide by two. They may not have said it. The Tribune could have got it wrong. But if they said that, if Kendra Vasquez said that, and the Lawrence Teachers Union said that, we have identified the problem. Because I guarantee you these kids are not fighting because of the COVID lockdowns. They're fighting because of lack of discipline and consequences. Period. And Kendris Vasquez, when he was faced with this, with, with this issue before the Department of Education, and the Department of Education said, we're not giving Lawrence control of their schools back because they're not capable of running their schools. They haven't shown us anything that says that they're willing to do that or that they're capable of doing that. Instead of Kendris Vasquez taking the bull by the horns, he cried racism. And why did he cry racism? Because it's a lot easier to, to sell newspapers the next day if the headline is, Mayor calls Department of Ed racist. Rather than, mayor agrees with Department of Ed, something must be done. Which headline sells more papers? And he knows which headline sells more papers. So to distract your attention away from the violence in the schools, to distract your attention away from the fact that the teachers and the administrators are doing a fucking horrible job educating your kids in Lawrence, he makes it about race. Because then, what does everybody talk about? Race. And you know what's not being done? Solutions. Whenever they're talking about race, you've, you've got to understand one thing. What they're doing is not talking about solutions on the national level, on the state level, and here at the local level. It, the dynamic is no different. Whenever, you'll notice that whenever a story on CNN, two or three days in a row about the border and kids in cages under Joe Biden, in under 24 hours, some cop beat up some black kid somewhere, and it's three days of racism discussions, and all of a sudden, no one's talking about the border anymore. They do this on purpose, folks. We get lied to by both sides. The Democrats are certainly worse than the Republicans are at this, but, but it's on both sides. We've been sold out by both parties, and all you have to do is look at the results. You know, I said to Vilma Laura when she was here, you know, and she was running for mayor. And by the way, I love Vilma Laura. We just feel differently about this. But, you know, if you have, I don't want to hear the teachers work really hard, right? Whenever you talk about teachers, you always get accused, and I always get accused. First of all, they pull what I call a Neil Perry. You said all teachers when I never said all teachers, okay? We're talking about teachers in general, right? But uh, the, the other thing that they pull is, uh, and I just had a total brain fart. I can't believe I did that. Where was I going on this? God damn it. I hate that. Um, uh, well, first of all, they, they, they always want to defend the teachers, right? They always want to defend. The, it's, it's not all teachers. No, but it's, it's enough of them. It's enough of them that it makes a difference. And are there good teachers in Lawrence? Yeah, there's some great teachers in Lawrence. Unfortunately, most of their hands are tied. Unfortunately, the good teachers don't have the, 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 the coping mechanisms and the support within the administration to teach their kids effectively. Both sides have sold us out on this. Oh, and, and all you have to do is look at how the sausage gets made. Look, and this, this is, I'm, glad it, I'm glad it finally came back to me. Don't tell me the teachers work hard. Don't tell me that they take money out of their pocket to pay for supplies. Don't tell me how hard they work, how many hours they put in, because... Let's take it out of education. Let's take the same dynamic in education and let's, let's apply it to car manufacturing. If you've got a car plant, let's say you've got a General Motors car plant and the people who work there are the nicest people in the world and every once in a while there's a widget missing from a machine and they go out and they spend money out of their own pocket and buy a widget for the machine. And they work really hard and they stay extra hours and they've got great team building skills. But at the end of the day, when the car comes off the lot, if it comes off the assembly line, if it doesn't work, they failed, period. And I'm looking at the result. 
I'm looking at the result of what's going on in Lawrence neighborhoods. I'm looking at the result of what's going on in Lawrence schools. Uh, I think the crime situation has gotten a lot better, but only because you've got a police chief that actually that, that actually is looking for solutions, not feel good bullshit. Right? Although he does do a lot, I have to admit, he does do a lot of the feel good bullshit with the ice cream truck and all that stuff. Fine, I get it. There's politics involved and you have to do that. But but overall, Lawrence is failing because the leaders of Lawrence are failing. And because every time somebody tries to point out a problem, they cry racism. Look, they do it to me all the time. Whenever I try to point out that there's a problem with violence in Lawrence, I'm in a shooting, I'm in a fire, because that's the nature of my job, right? That's what I have to do. People are always saying, you're making Lawrence look bad. No, I'm not making Lawrence look bad. The shooting makes Lawrence look bad. And when someone tries to call out the problem and you cry racism, how many people come on my Facebook page? Tom, you're just a racist. You just hate Lawrence. Well, as long as you are doing that, no one's ever going to solve the problem because no one's ever going to take the problem seriously because no one's going to be able to identify the problem. I remember when two years ago, Donald Trump was was, was president and he called out Lawrence, Massachusetts by name and said that Lawrence was the hub of the opioid crisis in New England, that the opioid problems and the opioid deaths and the homelessness and the addiction that are being experienced in Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire are all coming from Lawrence. And Dan Rivera, who was mayor at the time, again, another Kendris Vasquez, right? He just he, he pulls another Kendris Vasquez, holds a press conference the day Donald Trump did that. And instead of saying the home run answer, right? Instead of saying, Donald Trump is right. Lawrence has become the, the, the opioid center of, of, the, of the Merrimack Valley in New England. And so now that the president has identified the problem ad- adequately, I'm going to challenge the president to give us $50 million to have a special drug task force in Lawrence that spends 24-7 cleaning out the drugs. That was the home run answer. Instead, he pulled a Kendris Vasquez. Instead, he held a press conference and said, Donald Trump's a racist. He's picking on us because we're brown. He's picking on us because of the color of their skin. And he played into the national narrative that Donald Trump is a racist because, again, while he's talking about racism, what's not being talked about? Solutions. He never once during his press conference after the Donald Trump announcement, he never once held a press conference at that day or any other day and said, and here's what we're going to do about it. Instead, it was deny the problem and accuse anybody who's identifying the problem as racist so they'll shut the hell up and I can maintain my political power, and I don't have to work hard enough to do anything about it, right? So you want to know why Lawrence looks the way that it does? By the way, a lot better than it has in the, in the past. I, I am going to say, Lawrence has made tremendous progress in a lot of areas. I don't want you to think I'm dumping on the city. But the city's got some serious problems, as most major cities do. And the reason why you still have those problems after billions, with a B, after billions have been pumped into the city of Lawrence over the last 30 years is because our leaders don't want to solve the problem. There's more money to be made in not solving the problem. There's more political power to be had by not solving the problem. Blaming the other, blaming the white racists, blaming the people in Andover, blaming the state, blaming the federal government, saying they're not doing enough. Well, let me tell you, the state and the federal government in Lawrence are doing plenty. Lawrence's tax base, $45 million, right, Rich? 45? I don't know. Am I close? I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive that it's $45 million is Lawrence's tax base. That's the money that Lawrence brings in from local property tax. I believe Lawrence's city budget, I'm going to guess, you tell me if I'm right. I believe Lawrence's city budget is somewhere around $210 million. Am I right? Give it to me again. Okay, that's even worse. So Lawrence's budget is $350 million. Think about that. Lawrence spends every year at least $350 million. It's going to be more next year and more the year after that, right? But they only bring in $45 million in local property taxes. That means $305 million this year came into Lawrence from the state and federal government. Trust me, the state and federal government are doing plenty. Stop blaming the state. Stop blaming the federal government. Stop blaming the kids. Stop blaming their parents. Stop blaming the violence in their neighborhood. And start blaming the people in charge. And the people in charge, as of right now, the people in charge are doing a horrible job educating your kids. 
holding administrators accountable, having police officers in the school that will arrest children, not put them in in-house suspension for a period and put them back in the classroom. And as long as that continues, as long as Lawrence votes, Lawrence voters vote for elected officials based on name recognition or ethnicity or any of that other bullshit, you're going to continue to have what you've always had. As long as there are white people who won't vote for Latinos, as long as there are Latinos who won't vote for white people, as long as there are Dominicans that won't vote for Puerto Ricans and Puerto Ricans who won't vote for Dominicans, this is what you're going to get. And you're going to get it every year and it's going to get worse every year. There's, there's no exception to that rule. You know they say there's an exception to every rule? There's no exception to that rule. That's the exception to the rule, right? Lawrence is a great community with a lot of good people, but you guys have to step up. You know, I said on my last show, which actually is going to be next week's show because we taped it early. In Methuen last year, they had uh, two years ago in Methuen, they had five people running for six spots on the school committee. And that was after we found out in Methuen that the superintendent didn't have certification and overspent by $4 million. You would think in a community like Methuen that teachers would be, uh, that parents would be outraged, that parents would be storming the ballot to get new representation on the school committee to fix these problems for their kids. But they didn't. They didn't. And you had five people running for six spots, and I believe it was Ryan DeZoglio, I think, that ran on stickers to, that, that won that sixth spot. Now, look, at Ryan's a nice kid, but there's no, reason, there's no reason why he ever should have been able to get elected. If you had somebody with a doctorate degree, if you had somebody with a master's degree, if you had a business owner that decided to run, Ryan never would have had a chance to run. There would have been six people on the ballot for six jobs. And Lawrence is doing the same stupid shit. You know, Lennon Barroa is running, I think, in District B for city council. I'm sorry, for school committee. He's the only one on the ballot. And by the way, in the primary, there was nobody on the ballot. In District B, you had literally, or is it District C? I might have the districts mixed up. I think he's District C. There was nobody on the ballot in the primary, which means anybody can, anybody can get 50 write-ins, and if you get 50 write-ins, your name's on the final and you win, right? So you mean to tell me, in Lawrence, you've got over 95,000 people if you include illegals. Over 95,000 people, and not one person ran for school committee in District B? Not one person ran for school committee in District C. Estella Reyes is the, who's wonderful, by the way, please vote for her, even though she's got no opposition, but she's the District B city councilor and no one's running against her. No candidate, no elected official. I don't care how good they are. I don't care how great they are, and Estella Reyes is pretty great. But no one should run unopposed. Neil Perry and Methuen should not be running unopposed. Uh, Jim McCarty and Methuen should not be running unopposed. Uh, Eunice Ziegler and Methuen should not be running unopposed, and Lennon Barella shouldn't be running unopposed, and neither should Santiago Reyes Cruz and District B shouldn't be running unopposed in Lawrence. People at the local level, you need to step up. Otherwise, you lose control of your schools, you lose control of your police department, you lose control of your sewer, your DPW, and your community fails. And Lawrence has continued to fail. They've made great strides. They're a lot better than, Lawrence a lot better off than they were five years ago. That I agree with. No, no question about it. The city looks cleaner. Still not clean, but cleaner. There's less violence. The police have a zero tolerance policy on parties now. There's a lot of stuff that they're doing to train. But overall, if you remove the police department, Lawrence is a fucking nightmare. It just is. The schools are a nightmare. Inspectional services are a nightmare. Do you know, I'm glad we still have time, and I'm glad it hit me in the head. There's transitional housing in Lawrence for homeless people. Now, you know I'm a homeless advocate. There's a guy that was in Lawrence who was homeless for years, and finally we got him into rehab, we got him clean, and he went into a transitional uh, apartment on Haverhill and Broadway. We went to visit him. We went, went to bring him food because now that he's got a roof over his head, he still needs food, right? We went to bring him food one day. Cockroaches everywhere. Rats and mice everywhere. No heat, windows that were broken, uh, snow coming into the guy's apartment building. They had, they had a tiny little refrigerator and that was it. If that's what Lawrence is offering to the people on the streets as an alternative, no wonder why there's so many people on the streets. You couldn't get, you try getting away with that in Andover. You, you try putting in a transitional housing for homeless people in Andover, North Andover, Drake it, Methuen that is riddled with cockroaches, riddled with rats and mice, that uh, countless code violations, countless health violations, 
and are still in business. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Andover would shut that down in a day. Methuen, I, I know Neil Perry. You know, I mean, like him or don't like him, he would shut that down in a day. In a day, that would be done. Okay? You go into North Andover, in a day, it would be done. You go into Drake it, in a day, it would be done. In Lawrence, it's been operating for five years or more than I know of. And by the way, that's not the only one. 77 South Union Street, riddled with cockroaches, riddled with mice, riddled with rats, all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. Where are the city inspectors? Where's the mayor saying, I don't care if they are the poorest of the poor. I don't care if they're sex offenders. I don't care if they're drug addicts. They're in a rooming house. They should at least be able to live in a, in a safe environment in their own rooming house that doesn't have cockroaches and doesn't have rats. But in Lawrence, they go, well, the state should do more. The federal government should do more. Why aren't they so, that was Dan Rivera's big go-to when he was the mayor. That was his big go-to. The state should do more. We can't do everything here in Lawrence. Well, you know what? You can do it in Lawrence because you're getting 350 fucking million dollars of my tax money and you're only spending $45 million of your own. How about you take some of that money, you hire an inspector, you go over to 77 South Union Street, you go over to Broadway and, and, and Havel Street and you either shut it down, or which is not the right solution, or you make sure they keep it brought up to code. You find the building owner every day. You say to them, look, you can't afford an exterminator. We'll send an exterminator in. The city will have a grant and we'll send an exterminator in. You have people that live at the Wingate on Broadway near uh, uh, Haverhill Street that's worse than 77 South Union Street and the one on, Haverhill, Haverhill, uh, on, the, on the very corner. Come on, people. Now, as an outsider, I'm going to get all kinds of emails after the show that I'm trashing Lawrence. I'm not trashing Lawrence. I'm trashing Lawrence's leaders. Because the people who live in these conditions, they don't want to live in these conditions. It's not their fault. Right? If you're a homeless person and, and your, your only other alternative is to live at the Wingate, you know what? Give me a tent. I'm under the bridge too. I'm not living with cockroaches and rats crawling all over me while I'm sleeping in one of those rat, rat infested holes. But where's Kendris? He's been on the city council forever. He's acting mayor. Where is he? Where's the city council? Where are they? Where's inspectional services? Where are they? $350 million of your money. So listen, the election's coming up. Somehow I burned a whole show on this, which is pretty good, um, considering I had literally nothing when we started. But when you go and you vote on election day, please think about these things and don't be voting for people based on their last name or their neighborhood. Right? Don't be voting for people based on their race. Don't be voting for people based on how old they are or not. And a lot of people are saying, oh, a lot of young people are all voting for Kendris because he's young. That's a dumb reason to vote for somebody. Any more than if, if an older person said, we're all voting for Brian because he's a little older. It's a dumb reason to vote for. If that's, how, if that's your reason for voting, please stay home. Don't vote. I, I'm a big fan of voter suppression. I really am. I know that pisses off a lot of people in politics because it's not politically correct. I am. There are, there are too many people voting who don't know what the hell they're doing. Please stay home. If you don't know what your city council does, if you don't know what a city councilor does, don't vote. If you don't know what the, the duties of a mayor are, please don't vote. If you haven't gone online and researched your candidates and you know their background and you know why you want to vote for them and what their positions are on actual issues like education, then please don't vote. You have a lot of time. You have 12 days now between now and Election Day in Lawrence. Go online and research the candidates. Go to their Facebook page. And if they don't tell you on their Facebook page where they stand on important issues like homelessness, like the rooming houses in Lawrence, like the crime in Lawrence, which is getting better, uh, the education in Lawrence, if they're not spelling out what it is that they're going to do to fix the problem, don't vote for them. Don't vote for them. Don't just vote for somebody because, well, I'm Puerto Rican, he's Puerto Rican, I'm voting for him. I'm Dominican, he's Dominican, I'm, I'm white, he's white, I'm voting for him. That's what got you in this problem in the first place. And by the way, that's not a Latino problem. When I was growing up, it was unheard of that an Italian would get elected in Lawrence. Irish people would not vote for Italians. I know all we hear is white supremacy, white supremacy, right? But it was white on white. And we never called it racism and nobody ever cried about it. If you were Italian, it was very hard to get elected in Lawrence. It was almost impossible. And you can go back and you can look at the names of every mayor we've ever had. I think, I think maybe one Italian, maybe. And, I, and, and the more I'm thinking about it, I think he, I think he ended up losing that election to, to John Buckley. 
Make sure you vote. Vote for school committee, vote for city council, and vote for mayor if you know what you're doing. And my suggestion, as we, uh, as we, you can wrap up the show, uh, Chrissy, as we start wrapping up the show, my, su- I, my suggestion, I've got some friends that are running. Some of them, I'm, I'm going to tell you not to vote for them, right? Because they're not, they're not going to do a good job. Right? But I'm going to tell you the people that are running that I think will do a good job. Brian DePena, I think, would be a great mayor, and I want to thank him for sponsoring the show. And by the way, I'd be endorsing him whether he was sponsoring the show or not, uh, contrary to what you know, no party seems to think. Yeah. Estella Reyes is running unopposed. Please vote for her anyway. Don't leave it blank. She does a good job. Mark LaPlante is running unopposed in District F. Please don't leave it blank. He does a good job. If you've got a council that's doing a good job and then running unopposed, don't, please don't leave it blank. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, I lost my list. Oh, Lennon Roa is running unopposed. He's running for school committee district C. Uh, Rich Russell is not running unopposed. Please give him a vote. Him and Anna Levy at large, please vote for them uh, at large. By the way, Rich Russell, he'll do a great job. Rich Russell will ask the questions that I ask on this show. So please vote for, please vote for Rich. Brian uh, Stephanie Infante is running in the district F city council race. We love her. A special shout out to my girl, Maria De La Cruz. I love Maria mm-hmm. De La Cruz. She's so good to me. Jorge Gonzalez. Uh, and who else did I leave out? Santiago Reyes Cruz. Um, uh, can you just go re- again. Okay, good. Cause I, I'm going to talk about my sponsors because I was very yeah. neglectful of them today. I want to thank Brian, our sponsors, Brian DePina, the Great Lawrence Technical School, Dave Id Consoli from Pleasant Valley Landscaping, who was here last week to referee between me and Neil. Yeah. He did a good job. He did a good job. He did job. a good job. It was it was tough given was. given what we had to deal with, mm-hmm. but it, but it, he was really just trying to bring people together and try and make things work. Yep. Thanks to DJ Boragad, that is now a failure. We want to thank DJ <laughs> for that. Yeah. DJ was so mad that Neil Perry came on my show that he baited me into a text message conversation about Neil and started texting Neil screenshots of what I was saying about him because he was so mad that he didn't want him to come on the show. And by the way. I mean, you know, I like Neil, but shame on Neil for falling for it, right? I mean, if you're going to be that manipulated by your counselors, then, you know, that's on you. Uh, we also want to thank Clear Path for Veterans New England. They help our homeless veterans and get service dogs. Tomo and Happy Crab. Borelli's Deli. I'm going to get my super hot special yeah. sausage that Don's making for me today. EIS Investigation and Gun Training. Marsan and Son Construction. McLennan Real Estate. We'll get Matt, uh, Matt McLennan on the show again. And AFC Urgent Care with Lisa Williams and her husband. We love them. Melvin Taylor says we got to go home for the second time, so oh. go home already. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.